personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information that these businesses need to know now. I have a very special guest on the show, a fellow Chicagoan, actually, uh, Dr. Meche Kangla. She's the CEO and Chief Data Strategist of Data Products, LLC. So uh, I'm happy to have you on the show. Dr. Meche. Thank you, Debbie. It's my pleasure. I'm very, <laughs> very excited to uh, talk to you today. So, so we'll start a bit. So I feel like we have to have a, have a, a background about you. So um, the cool thing is we met on, on LinkedIn. You had contacted me and we had ended up having a call and I was super excited, uh, you know, to see a woman of color, black woman in uh, in data, the data science area, and also you're a mathematician, which I was excited about as well. So we talked, and you had asked me to speak at a conference that you had called Data Yap, and I want to get into that as well. And then it's so funny because we started talking about ways that we can collaborate, and then I said, oh, I'm doing this other thing about... Uh, what was it was a post quantum computing. Is that what That's it was? Right. Yeah. So, so you ended up on a on a panel. It was me, you, and two lawyers from New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, Ron Hedges, who's a, a former judge who's at Denton's right now, and then Gail Goderer, who is in her own practice in emerging technology. So, this was a amazing session that we did together uh and i was so happy that it was just very good timing uh and then it's great for me because i always like to have people who don't know each other meet each other so like now you're all in in, you're all plugged in uh you know to my new york friends uh with new york state bar association uh but i would love for you to talk more expansively about your kind of career trajectory into, you know, uh, data science. And then I would love to talk about sort of where you focus and and your data app conference. Oh, thank you. So um, great. How did I get into data science, data strategy? A couple of decades ago, I'm not going to say how long. Uh, when I was in school studying, uh, I happened to do my, my bachelor's and a master's degree in math and computer science, which was strange because when you graduated at that time, you're not considered a pure mathematician, so you wouldn't even get the juicy research jobs, and you, in, you weren't considered um, a pure computer scientist, and so you can get hands or coding job as well. So you're stuck in this sort of cross-limbo uh, look down upon sort of section. Uh, but I enjoyed what I did, right? I literally went to school. I didn't have a major and I went any mighty mo on the catalog, took my first course and fell in love with it. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, after working, uh, after well, after graduating, I decided to go for a PhD and did a PhD in, in applied mathematics and then did a stint at Lawrence Livermore as a postdoc, where I did some research um, using data. Um, Again, uh, the idea was about researching massive amounts of data, how you can make them compact, small enough so that you can run regular algorithms and computations on to get the same accuracy as the large amounts. That was the focus of my research. And decided that I wanted to get into a more industry application. I want to work in real world problems and tangibly see the effects of the of the work I was doing, right? And uh, worked for some startups. And, and that time there was no data science, right? It was that's some sort of newly coined term. You were a quant, that's what you were, or algorithm scientist. So did that for a little bit, and then got uh, worked at Groupon. Uh, moved on, uh, worked at some uh, at EY, some uh, director positions, and then decided I wanted uh, to do my own thing. And so I came back and uh, I work at this data science consulting firm, uh, Data Products, 
which you guess you guess it, we build data products for our clients. And my journey has not been a straight path with one of sort of meandering all within the same space using my mathematical skills as well as my uh, computer science skills to sort of drive in this emerging field right now that we call data science. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, for me, I was really excited to meet you because people think that people like you don't exist, which black women in mathematics, black women in, you know, technology and computer science and things like that. You kind of crisscross that, uh, you know, you go across a lot of different things, right? That people don't think about, you know, you or us in those ways. So tell me a little bit about the importance of women, you know, women, women definitely in science and tech and definitely sort of your experience of being a woman of color in that area. Um, that's a deep question. <laughs> and one that's also very, very dear to me. Um, and important, important, not just to me, I think to the community and our society as well, at large. So while I was a student, I went to University of Illinois, Chicago, and uh, back in the early 2000s there in graduate school, I was the only black student in the math department. And not just black student, there were no black math professors in the department as well. So for me, I was, I, of course I noticed it, but I guess I was very comfortably in positions where I was the odd one, the odd looking one, so to speak, or the difference, I should say, looking one. And it never occurred to me, I thought, well, maybe just black people don't do like doing this, but I couldn't fathom why, because I enjoyed it so very much. Um, one of, the, before I go for talk a bit further, I would say one of the reasons I enjoyed it very much was, it was the one way I felt I could fight any discrimination, whether warranted or not, because science was science, no one was going to tell me that this proof was wrong, where I could clearly show that it was correct. So I felt like my work could speak for itself in that manner. That was a strong pull, I guess, one of the added benefits of why I loved what I did. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that story. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I like the empirical nature of data. So that I can concur. <laughs> I concur with, uh, yeah, but I fell into technology by happenstance. I just, um, I was going to go to law school. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer my mm -hmm. um, senior year of college. And I thought I wanted to spend more time with her. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I can't go away anywhere. So how can I find a way to make money, stay busy yes. and be with her. So I you know, bought a computer, taught myself to use it. And I just fell in love with data, really, just how data flows and moves. And that's kind of been my interest. So I think that's sort of, you know, maybe that crisscrosses. So I'm a good reader. I understand, you know, law quite a bit, um, worked with people in law for decades. So that's kind of how I got into my career. Um, you, you, you have to explain to me kind of the spectrum. I feel like, I feel like people can't really grasp a AI, right? To me, I think mm -hmm. people think about it as like a movie, right? They think about <laughs> it as, you know, this robot took over and did stuff to me that I didn't really want or whatever. Um, you know, we have all these dystopian future things about, AI and technology, but can you tell me, talk to me about kind of the realm of a AI as a whole and sort of where you fit into that AI realm? Right, uh, that's, that's a good, um, that's a good, really good point to bring up. And I, I, I spend a lot of time, I have another passion of mine is data democratization which on data literacy, where people understand, everyday people understand everything around data because it really affects them. We live in a digital world. There's no one that's currently living that uh, they do not interact with data in some form. So it's important that they have some, at least very high level understanding of what these terms, is, these terms are and how um, they affect them. 
but back, uh, not to digress too far about AI. So when we think of AI, a lot of people think of some futuristic movie, uh, maybe The Matrix, right? And the Sentinel bots or some sort of fi- high uh, sci-fi stuff in that matter. But really, AI is really just artificial intelligence. All it means is uh, you're asking, you build a program, a process, a heuristic that mimics the way a human thinks, right? So uh, a very classic example I like to give is, doesn't involve high level computing at all. So if you're as old as I am, I'm really older at my age, you remember the day when you would go to work and have to punch a card. To mark when you come in and punch a card when you go out. That can be considered a basal level AI system, right? Because it's sort of mimicking the what you would have originally done, which is come in and sign your name on the sheet, then write the time you come in, and when you leave, sign your name and write the time you leave. So by automating that task, where no one needs to sit there and punch, you're just basically punching a card. Uh, that is automated. That is artificial intelligence. Now, the sort of difference I like to make with artificial intelligence and machine learning is uh, the which people use interchangeably all the time, but really are not the same thing. Machine learning is um, the idea of, um, of a computer system or program, I like to say, um, acting in a manner to reduce the errors in in terms of something is errors in terms of reducing the probability of errors that it makes in some sort of calculation. I'll give you a, a classic example. So, as humans, uh, imagine you're a baby or you have a baby. The baby crawls and learns to stand, but the baby realizes that there's a particular corner of the room that's probably not so flat. Whenever the baby crawls or tries to stand over there, tumbles and falls. Right. So the baby learns then that whenever uh, he or she is at that corner of the room to hold on to something so they don't fall. That aspect of learning, right, by reinforcement, it could be by reinforcement in terms of they did it one time and fell down or someone told them not to do it and, uh, and then they followed that uh, instructions and, not, and didn't do it. That's a learning aspect. So imagine taking that and implementing it within a, within a system or a program or algorithm where the algorithm you're teaching the algorithm if you if you uh, print out x and someone responds y then you respond z that is learning that's a sort of a, a trained learning system and the other hand if you tell them to sort of go through a sort of examples and they get feedback where they're like if, if they responded if the, the machine printed x and someone responded y they got some reinforcement, positive reinforcement, then next time they will print a Y. If they printed Y and uh, they got some negative reinforcement, then next time they will not print a Y, they'll print something else. That's all learning is. Yeah, that's a great, those are great examples actually. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I would love to talk about ethics, ethics and AI. This is such a, this is like a super hot, hot topic, right? And I don't know, I would love to hear your thoughts about what you think about ethics and AI. For me, I think that humans bring the ethics to AI. So I don't think, I don't think algorithms can be ethical on their own. Like they, they absorb the ethics of the person or I feel like the human has to be the judgment, you know, brings the judgment, brings kind of, the, the knowledge, because I feel like computers, even as, or algorithms, as they get more advanced, and they do, you know, more sophisticated things, they can't think or reason like a human all the time, right? So, I don't know, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, my goodness, uh, we we're talking about all the hot topics today, I feel. So, ethics is, I wouldn't just say important, I would say critical, right? Um, and you can't really talk of ethics in a vacuum. If you talk with eth- of ethics, I feel it comes hand in hand with responsibility. Right? And the, one of the reasons I feel it's again a lot more press is just is be- beyond the, the norms of it's a good thing to do. It's beyond the, it's more to do with the fact that 
some sort of events have occurred and there is associated responsibility here and therefore it is uh, lit the fire over this discussion of uh, what is what was where does the responsibility lie when in what fashion so if we talk about responsibility uh, when you build a system, so you're, you're an attorney, let me give you the perfect example. You're an attorney. You have to go to school to study. You have to take a license, right? Uh, board and you have to do some continued education to be able to practice law legally. If you were to make a mistake or do something that had uh, an effect, the honors of the responsibility for that effect lies, of that outcome lies with you. But we live in an age where everything is becoming digitized. AI is being imbued in all our lives and all everything that we use. However, the companies that build these systems really don't want to bear the responsibilities of the outcomes. And therefore they point out to the user and say, you are responsible for using our system. But that's ridiculous. It's like going to an attorney or a doctor and the doctor performing surgery on you. And then the doctor saying, you are responsible for the surgery that I just performed on you. Right? There's, there's a disconnect, there's a heavy disconnect there. And uh, th then the, the talk about ethics. I feel really any, if you're responsible for building a system or a solution or a program that affects people's life in any single manner, you should really be responsible for that, whether there's a law or not. I, you and I agree a thousand percent on that. Um, I hear a lot of people, mostly people who try to sell AI, unfortunately, um, try to, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's an automatic thing, but I mean, I've talked to companies and I've talked to people over time that have brought in, you know, some forms of artificial intelligence to help them or machine learning. And it's almost a knee-jerk reaction to, to them to think, oh, wow, well, this does this, then that means I don't have to do, you know, anything. Like, that's, that's the opposite of what it means. I think it means that you have to step up and take responsibility and make sure that you understand, you know, what it's doing because, it, you know, the algorithm is supposed to be doing things on your behalf and shouldn't be doing things that harm individuals. So I think, you know, it's very important to be vigilant. Um, one, one thing that I, I touch on a lot is bias, uh, bias in AI. Um, and I, it's scary to me when I hear people say that I don't think AI is biased. I'm like, you know, hold up, you know, people are biased, people make AI, AI, bias gets in AI. And then, you know, the example that I give is what's happening sometimes now is uh, the correlation I would give is like, people have different blood types, right? So mm -hmm. let's say someone created this transfusion and they're like, okay, this works, you know, really well, you know, my blood type is O. And then I'm not going to test on other blood types because it works, but then I'm going to use it on people with other blood types. So you, you, as you know, if you give someone a transfusion with a blood type they don't have, they could die, right? But so this is to me a parallel of what's happening with AI, where it's being tested in a smaller sense, unfortunately, and then it's being hoisted on many different people you know, just to see what happens. And it's like, in a medical situation, that just could not happen. So I feel like we're treating technology differently, even though it can have, you know, as harmful of an effect, if not more of a harmful effect on people kind of over time. What are your thoughts? Oh my goodness, I completely agree with you. And this is prevalent, I think, not even just in AI, particularly in AI because of the rate at which it's been adapted into society, but in all aspects. In medicine, it's been occurring, right? So you hear about studies that are being done in 2018 where uh, the belief about how a disease or how a disease shows up in a smaller set of population, whether it's brown or black or women people, a women uh, group of people, it's not the typical way that's thought. So doctors that are trained and not, are not able to recognize it because they have not been thought about this. 
there is this, not to digress again, I have all these anecdotes, but this medical student that wrote this book of common diseases and how they show up in black people just because medical students were not exposed to that. And funny that you should bring this up too. I'm just reading this book, Invisible Wound. This is incredible and it recounts hundreds of stories of how products are created, but the idea of who is tested, the model in which this is tested, is not, does not represent even 50% of the population, right? You hear about astronaut suits, NASA, for God's sakes, doesn't have a size that fit women and they had to go recreate it because the standard model that was used to create the suits was a man. You hear about testing um, in cars, right? The airbag system, the dummies, it's the man that's tested. And so the safety precautions that are built in for this dummy are based on a man dummy. The proportions do not match. You hear about uh, building systems where the uh, the heat level uh, and the AC level are set based on the standard temperature of the body heat of a man. And that's why women are typically all colder in the offices in the summer because the temperature is set for a way that's not really uh, catering to their core temperature. But I digress. All these examples are nothing new. They've been going on for, for a very, very long time. But with the rate at which we're adopting AI, this is just blasting, right? And it's incredible. And it's the same phenomenon where people go, if you experience a bias, people go, uh, for those listening, I am a black woman, <laughs> if you hadn't picked up on that. And if you recount an experience of uh, something that happened to you and a bunch of people that are not of your color and or women will tell you they have never experienced that before sort of discounting your experience because they haven't, therefore you have not. I think that plays the same thing with AI when you actually talk about the ways that um, solutions have been built to sort of not take into account inbuilt discrimination and bias, people respond with, well, I have never experienced it. Yeah, that's probably one of the, the least, my least favorite comments that anyone would ever make. It's like, <laughs> oh, well, I don't have that experience. Like that doesn't mean anything. Because I'm telling you that I've had it. So, you know, uh, I can't tell you what happened to you, but I can discuss what has happened to me. So I always like to say, you know, like you go to the grocery store and you step on the mat and the door opens automatically so you can walk in. Mm -hmm. But every, every time you go to the mat at the grocery store and the door doesn't open, you know, mm -hmm. you say, okay, there's a problem here. And someone say, well, when I walk through the door, it opened. So there's not a problem. I'm like, you know, that's a fallacy in and of itself. Just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean that it didn't happen. So I, I'm going to check that book out, Invisible Woman. That's really interesting. Um, so when we talk about AI and we talk about data, right? So data is about humans. Uh, they can be about many things. But when I'm thinking about data, I'm thinking about data of humans, what is your concern right now about the privacy of individuals' data? Oh, my word. From the three-year-old to the 90-year-old grandma, we all are using data, where our data is being used, whether it's tracking in terms of our phone, which is the most prevalent use, in terms of where we've been, right? the idea of you go where you, you are, where you go. So I can basically know exactly who you are as a person by just tracking your GPS locations, where you spend your time, right, throughout the day over a period of time, or to the monitoring in terms of how you use a phone, to um, go into a grocery stores and having cameras track your facial expression, we hear stories about that. And everyone just goes, well, it's all right. And it's, there's the, there is this notion of if you're not feeling it or seeing the impact immediately is something that's far removed and therefore you can take a seat, uh, back seat, right? Now this is where data literacy, in my mind comes, uh, it's really critical. People need to understand what they're giving away. And I think there's a, they, we don't, the society do not understand um, the impact of that, right? They're just resigned to, well, if they want me to give me, sign my consent to use my data, therefore I have to. And because we're resigned, we're not really paying attention to the effects of this. And I cannot stress, uh, imagine how you have a camera, this is the only way I can explain it, but imagine you have a camera or a person 
that follows you around every single day, every single minute, in the shower, everywhere, everything you're doing, they're watching and recording you. That's really what your personal data is. Right. And then there's what I call meta metadata. So data about data about data. So uh, things like, uh, and I had a guest uh, on the show, we talked about this, which is really interesting. So, you know, he was saying that some people on their phones, there's a statistic that's saying that people scroll on their phones, like on their Facebook or whatever, Mm -hmm. they scroll, they can scroll every day, like almost like the height of the um, Statue of Liberty. And Mm -hmm. just what the things that you look at the longest Mm -hmm. tell marketers things about you that you may not even, you've not uttered, right? You've not Mm -hmm. said anything, Mm -hmm. but they're looking at your actions. And the future to me is about the gaze of the individual. Mm -hmm. So technology is a lot of technologies are are being developed. They want to know what you look at, Mm -hmm. what you, you know, what you like, what you love, you know, what catches your attention because they want to give you more of that because they want more of your gaze. So being able to have, to me, this is a whole other category of data, right? Because, you know, you could, to me, that's personal data in some way, but you, you don't even know that it's being gathered and you don't know what is being uh, calculated about you as an individual as a result of kind of your actions and activities and things that you look at. What are your thoughts? Uh, I don't think there's anything for me to add. You said it all. It's, it, it really is that nuance in terms of how detailed they can get. And the game, name of the game, I build, I myself, I build products in this sort of light. And I am aware, aware I'm well aware of the privacy issues, right? And I, 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 I am of the notion that it's not strongly, um, the alarm is not strongly sounded enough in terms of what people understand, what they're really giving away. Because it's astounding. The game of the game is about having users spend more time on your website, on your app, on your solution. Even if they're not buying, you just want people to spend more time on your website for several reasons, right, as marketer. If they're on your website, they're not on your competitors. If they're on your website, you're learning about them and hopefully can serve them better, which means that they can then in the future buy, you can build brand loyalty. There's a host of reasons. So how do you keep someone on your website and your app longer? You want to understand how they navigate it and cater to the way they navigate it, which is all the meta meta monitoring, uh, the data that you just example that you just mentioned. Yeah, and I think to me that leads, you know, especially the kind of this monitoring and trying to trying to tempt you with things that they think you want to see. You know, a lot of times that creates these fringes, right, where things are one extreme or the other. Um, you know. I don't think is, I don't think anyone would be interested in me going to Costco. Like that's one of my things that I do, but you see people online, they're attracted to more extreme things. Mm -hmm. And even though they're, they may be bad, you know, these companies like that because if you spend your time looking at that, that tells them that, that maybe there's a product that they can sell you. There's Mm -hmm. something you know, they, they want your attention. So for the time that they, they have your attention, they want to know what they can show to you. So it's, it's quite uh, uh, concerning. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll add this. I am a data strategist. So what I work with is I work with organizations and executive leaders to build this sort of product. So it's not always nefarious. It's really about serving the people. But you as a consumer, you as a person, you should be aware right, of what it is that you're doing by engaging with this product. So you really need to be. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think education is really key. And then I think, you know, the, 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 the thing that's so hard with stuff like this is that, you know, you get the benefit almost immediately, right? When you download an app, you know, you want to do something right now, which is great. And then there can be a harm 
that is in the future. <laughs> so you don't see the harm is not immediate sometimes. So because the harm can be in the future, some people do, you know, just click through and don't really think about it. And I think, you know, that's, that's disturbing. And I agree that we should have more education in that area. But then I ask you this, I'll follow up and ask you this. Who is responsible for instigating or pushing this discussion, right? This sort of uh, dissemination of the knowledge and importance about the privacy and ethics of all, of all the apps that we're using. Who's the responsible? Is it our government? Is it is individual? Is it the, the people that create the apps? Yeah. I don't, you know, the, the only answer I can give is that there is a responsibility. Everybody has some part of responsibility, right? But the problem is when it's everybody's problem, nobody wants to step up and own it, right? So no one owns this problem altogether. It's just kind of fragments of the problem, right? And then you just have people like us who want to say, hey, you know, don't touch that stove, it's hot, you know. <laughs> you know, watch out and not do this. And I'm hoping that that advocacy will help people companies and individuals make better decisions but you know there has to be shared ownership and shared responsibility and sort of more collaboration or you know uh, more collaboration with businesses more collaboration with individuals to understand what they want you know people who are pushing for things like regulation people you know like me I'm more on the proactive side, uh, as are you, where you're building products and stuff. Cause I, I wanna, you know, I feel like that's where I can have the, the most impact instead of firefighting, right? So this bad thing happened and then now let's see what we're gonna do where I think AI can be really damaging to people um, in ways that can't be resolved uh, reactively. So I think it's really important that we try to get this right. And I love that you're in this space and you're talking about these issues. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but there's still, there's, all has not been figured out, right? We're raising, there are issues that are there, certainly. Um, and there are some great people doing some great work and great organizations doing great work in the area, including you, your family, um, trying to advocate with the podcast and teaching people all about the this heavy critical uh, thing that's really in everybody's life. But I feel like more still needs to happen. Whatever, yeah. the, however that more is packaged in, who knows? But still yeah. something that more that needs to happen. I feel like the alarm is not loud enough. The volume, we need to uh, step it up in some fashion. Yeah. Whether, that, whether that might be it's some incident that uh, revs everybody up and like, no, we need to come up with um, some regulations or some sort of statutes in terms of people building this stuff to have some sort of license and schooling and whatever that be. Like, look, for example, what's going on in Europe, the way they're approaching it there, I feel like they're taking it a bit, a bit more serious than us in the Americas. Yeah. Even if not everything is 100% successful, I feel like they're really just going out and, you know, they're really swinging for the fence to try to say, hey, you know, this is a problem. We need to do something about it. And it needs to be somebody, somebody needs to take the reins and, right. and have a conversation. Um, I, I would love to talk a bit. I want you to tell me a little bit about your data yap conference and sort of kind of why you created that and, and what, what is kind of the purpose or the, the goal of that conference. Oh, thank you. So data yap really is a knowledge platform for all things data. Yes, it sounds broad. Really, our idea is to build an online community for professionals, like for professional practitioners, enthusiasts, students, business, executive leaders to talk about all things data. So one of the key things if you're in the data space, you find is if you're looking for some resources, content, a question, the first thing you do is pull up Google and go, uh, you type it and see the top five result, results and you, see, and you look through that. There is tons, so there are tons of content around data, tons everywhere, groups everywhere. People post resources every day, but it's not curated in any fashion. There's no guidance in terms of what's best, what's not, what comments, what's voted up. So Data App really is this platform with the vision of 
curating all this content that already exists. We're not creating new content, really. Curate, curating all this content that exists, right? With people giving their opinions and content. So we'll say, if you're an executive and you're looking for uh, some information around data strategy, what, uh, what analysts, or what papers of analysts release, you can go there and see and see other people's comments and sort of gauge what works for you. If you're looking for an event around data, it's a professional in a particular uh, city that you happen to be on a particular day, you can scroll in, basically pulling together all these resources that naturally already occur. And so it's to launch a soft launch of this data uh, platform, dataapp.com, we had this conference to sort of push into that step, right? So we have the data app, uh, conference that we brought together professors, uh, profess professors that uh, run educational programs around teaching data. We've had uh, professionals like you talking about privacy. We had people from government talking about government data. We had industry leaders talking about, it, it was a fantastic, fantastic conference. Yeah, it was wonderful. I was really excited to participate. And I actually enjoy talking at conferences that aren't about privacy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fun for me uh, because I get to know like a new community of people. And so, you know, data people are my people. So exactly. anyone who does data, you know, I'm down. So definitely call me up for stuff like that. Um, so if it was the world, um, according to Dr. Mete, uh, what would be your wish for privacy, whether it be technology, regulation, in anywhere in the world? Ooh, I would wish that people had the power to dictate what they wanted private or not. So you were not forced to sort of be, uh, sign on the license and give your privacy rights away in order to be able to use an application. That would be my ideal world. So two things to understand exactly, clearly, layman's terms, what privacy I was giving away when using it and make that decision of whether I wanted to give that away without taking away my right to actually use that product. Well, that was very succinct. I like that. That's really smart. Uh, I agree. And then, I don't know, for me, I want the right not to share, right? So. Yeah. I don't want to have to choose, you know, like it's okay, you're at this junction and you have to make this choice right the second. Like I want to not have to choose anything. <laughs> I want to just be. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll have that in the future. I have no idea. But, well, yeah, this is a fantastic session. Thank you so much uh, for sharing, you know, your knowledge and your expertise and uh, you know, I'm excited that we, uh, I'd love for us to collaborate more in the future. Uh, we've had some fun. <laughs> I absolutely agree. It was absolutely my pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you so very much for having me. On. Well, thank I'm sure we will be collaborating. I look forward to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Awesome.